Kim McIntosh and I teach biology at Shadow Mountain High School. And this presentation is about plants and how diverse this group is. And we're going to take a look at some of the different types of plants and, and why there's this diversity in plants. So plants are multicellular eukaryotes. So they're eukaryotic cells, which means they have a nucleus. Um, they're a little bit different from animal cells because they have that cell wall. Um, and they also have the vacuole, and so they, um, they store wastes a little bit differently than animal cells. And then they also have chloroplasts, and so plants are autotrophs. They use photosynthesis to create their energy, so they, they get that energy from the sun and they convert that to sugars, which is what makes up the plant's biomass or the body of the plant. So we're going to start with plant evolution because plants pretty much started out as water organisms. So they were in the water and mostly like algae ancestors. And then um, we started to see this reproduction by spores and we ended up with non-vascular plants. These were um, very low-lying plants. And, and eventually we got to where we saw some vascular tissue, which I'm gonna explain what these terms mean, but, um, and that developed into seedless vascular plants. So we started to see this growth of plants and they were getting taller. Um, and then eventually we start to see that we had seed plants. So we have gymnosperms and angiosperms, which are both seed plants. Um, gymnosperms don't have flowers, but angiosperms do. So how do you go from water to land? Well, this was, um, this was a series of adaptations that plants had to make because they had to be able to absorb nutrients. And so if you look at this picture down here at the bottom, these plants down here, they absorb nutrients um, and they really just take in the nutrients from the water around them. So their cells are exposed to those nutrients and they would just take them in to the cells. Um, but once you get onto land, you're in a drier environment and you don't have that contact with nutrients that are in the water um, throughout your cells. And you also have to be able to survive dehydration. So you need a way to not dry out. And then you also need a way to disperse, you know, you're growing in one location, how are you going to fill the space? How are you going to get from where you are as a species to filling in more of the landscape with plants? So there were several adaptations that plants made. Um, one, of the, one of the adaptations is that they develop this vascular system. So when we say vascular, we're, t we're talking about kind of like veins in our body. They transport water and nutrients around. Um, so plants develop this vascular system which allowed them to grow taller and be able to transport nutrients from low in the body of the plant to the top of the plant. So if you look at this picture right here, you see that there's this waxy layer right here that they're peeling up off of the plant. That's the cuticle and it's, it's really just a waxy layer that covers the surface of the plant and it allows the plant to hold in water and not uh, dry out as quickly. And then spores were another adaptation. So these are specialized reproductive cells. Um, they're protected from drying out. And that's really important if you're a plant on land, um, you need a way to get those gametes to, um, to not dry out. It's not like they're in the water and they're just going to disperse throughout the water and be in a watery environment anymore. Now they're in an air environment and so there needed to be some way to where the gametes would not dry out. And then seeds, was another um, adaptation. Seeds is another way to protect the gamete, but seeds have um, a little bit extra because they have a food source within the seed. And that allows 
the seed to be dormant for quite a while if it needs to be and then germinate or grow when conditions are, are right. And then another adaptation is pollination. And so you see these pollen grains that are covering this bee. This is an adaptation. So the bee is going to move these pollen grains from one flower to another flower and help fertilization that way. All right, so we're going to start out with the non-vascular plants because these are the ones that developed first. These are the ones that were the first onto a dry environment. And so we have things like moss and liverworts and hornworts, and these all reproduce by spores. So these are not seed plants. These only have spores to reproduce. And they, they don't have true root systems, and they don't have stems, and they don't really have leaves. So they're basically a plant mass that grows very close to the ground, and um, it can't get tall. It doesn't have the water uptake system of a root, and it doesn't have the transport system of a stem. So these are, um, these are plants that you would see growing very low to the ground or over rocks. And then we have seed plants. The first one is um, gymnosperms. And these are like conifers, cycads, ginkgos, gnetophytes. Um, and these, they, d they have their seed, but it's in a cone and not in a fruit. And so these are the cone trees. Um, and probably the most famous one is the one down here at the bottom that looks like a Christmas tree. So their gametophytes develop in cones, and um, both the male and the female cone can develop on the same plant. And then seed plants are called angiosperms, and these are all the flowering plants. So all flowering plants have seeds that develop enclosed within a fruit, um, and it's really easy for us to think about fruits. We think apples and oranges and grapes and watermelon. Those are fruits to us. But this would also include things like peas. Because the seeds develop inside of uh, the pea pod, we would call that a fruit technically. Um, and the fruits develop from part of the flower. So let's take a look at angiosperm anatomy. Um, what we see here is there are male reproductive parts, and so that would be these right here. Um, the anther, this part right here, that is where the pollen develops. So the anther is where the pollen develops, and then there's this filament right here that connects it. Okay, and so together we call these male reproductive parts the stamen. And then the female reproductive parts are over here. Okay, so these are male and these are female. And the female reproductive parts include the stigma. So that's this part right here that's reaching up towards the top of the flower. The style is the tube that leads from the stigma down to the ovary. And the ovary is basically just this protective case right here. And inside of the ovary is the ovule. And the ovule is where the egg cells develop. And the angiosperms also have petals. So that word is petal. It's hard to see on this picture. But petals are um, a great adaptation for angiosperms because they are generally bright and colorful. Um, and they also can be scented, and that attracts pollinators. And then down here towards the bottom, we have the sepal. This is that little um, leaf that you have right underneath the flowering part, and the sepal is there to protect this part of the flower. So it protects the ovary um, and protects the, the connection where the petals are. And then this part, of course, is the stem. Okay, so what happens here is pollen comes in to this plant and pollen lands on the stigma and it's transferred through the style to the ovary 
and to the ovule. And once that pollen reaches the ovule and the egg cell, that's when fertilization occurs. So that's when the sperm that's enclosed in the pollen will fertilize the egg cell that's enclosed in the ovule. And this ovary protects that embryo. So we have the little flower embryo, that's the fertilized cell. And the ovary protects that, and the ovary is actually the fruit that develops from the angiosperm. So when you eat an apple or you eat an orange, you're actually eating the ovary from a flower. And we have two different types of um, angiosperms. We have monocots and we have dicots. So monocots have a single cotyledon. So um, there's just one cotyledon. So mono means one and cot stands for cotyledon. And monocots all have um, long, narrow leaves with parallel veins. And then if we do a cross section of a monocot, we'll see that the vascular bundles are just randomly distributed throughout the stem. And one of the best ways to tell a monocot from a dicot is that monocots have flower parts in multiples of three. So it might have three petals, it might have six petals, it might have nine petals, it might have 12 petals. Um, but it'll be a multiple of three if it's a monocot. And then dicots have two cotyledons because di means two and cot again stands for cotyledon. And so within the seed, there'll be two cotyledons there. Monocots have broad leaves with a network of veins. So if you think about like a maple leaf, um, those have, they're very broad and they have a network of veins. It's not parallel. And so those would be dicots. When we do a cross section of the stem, we see a nice, neat, orderly ring of vascular bundles in there. And then their flower parts are in multiples of five, sometimes in multiples of four, but most of the dicots we see will have five petals.